We really want to come alongside people who've experienced a measure of staleness in their relationship with God. People who are looking around, maybe who've been going to church their entire lives, and they're looking around and they're seeing people in worship and people enraptured in their love with the Lord, and they can't relate to that, but they wish they could. Well, how can 24 bring an explosion of flavor to your spiritual taste buds? I know you just finished eating everything in sight if you're like me for the holidays, but here we are in a brand new year. Stephanie Roussel's hope-filled story is unforgettable. She's here as my guest today. She's a former atheist, and now she's the founder of Gospel Spice Ministries. Her life's motto is God's glory, our delight. She thrives on Bible-centered inspirational writing and speaking and dark chocolate. Stephanie, I'm so glad you are here on the Make Life Matter podcast. Welcome. Thank you. It is such a joy to be here with you, Angela. I feel giddy because I just adore you. I feel like I've known you now for maybe two years, but this is our first time to sit down really and have a more in-depth conversation. How can this be? I know. I well, I'm glad you're here. It took us a while, but I'm just thankful it's happening. And I cannot wait to deep dive into your story, Stephanie, but you were born and raised in France. And then I noted today that you have lived on three continents, four countries and five cities through six professional roles. So that's a mouthful. So talk about that. Talk about your upbringing. And, and then I want to really lean into the spiritual aspects of your story. Yes. Yes. Thank you. It's It really is a Truly such a delight to be with you, Angela. I love your ministry and what you're doing. You have such a big heart. And I know that your audience is so blessed to have you as their uh, pastor, coach, mentor, helper, guide, uh, all the things, friend, most of all, sister. Um, and so actually, it's interesting because as a non-Christian, that's everything I just described about you. This is where things that were very foreign to me. I would not have known to even use these words or have categories for what they represented. I grew up in France. Uh, on my side of the Atlantic Ocean, not too far from the from the water in the Bordeaux wine country. Mm -hmm. And I grew up as an atheist, which means that um, a very intellectual atheism. God is a man-made invention, a crutch mm -hmm. for weak people, very postmodern, dog-eat-dog -dog kind of world. And I wanted to be uh, on top of that world. And I wanted to be very capable, very self-sufficient. Um, I don't know if you can already... Um, smell and taste the arrogance and the independence and the control freakness of me uh, that by God's grace, he's, um, he's working on. And man, he's got his work cut out for him. <laughs> and, me. Uh, and so I, that's where I grew up. And I grew up learning um, a lot of the classical things of philosophy and Latin and some Greek and, you know, on the school benches of, of the public schools in France. And then one thing that the schools do not teach you really well, at least at the time, was English. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know English. So I came to the U.S. as a foreign exchange student, as a very strong atheist. At that point, I was 16. And it, I had not just uh, embraced my father's worldview in particular, who was a fervent atheist. I myself had really embraced that for myself. And so mm -hmm. it wasn't just, I wasn't just adopted into atheism. I had made that my own choice. So I come to the U.S. as a foreign exchange student. I do my senior year of high school um, in a school there. And lo and behold, the American family who has the generous kindness to host me for the entire year were believers. They were Christians. Wow. And um, I initially found out through snail mail. This is all pre-internet. Please understand I'm dating myself here. This was literally 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I was in the States as a high schooler. And uh, when I found out through their snail mail that they were Christians, I just had this preconceived idea that America at the time was still a Christian nation. Things have changed, yeah. but at the time it was the case. And so I thought that meant, you know, they'd go to church for Christmas and Easter and that was fine. I didn't really mind. I didn't think much more than that. And they welcomed me and they had three young children. They had no business taking on a, a 16 or 17 year old teenager, but they really had felt very strongly. The Lord was calling them to do that. It was the first time they were doing that. They have since have had six or eight set foreign exchange students, most of whom have come to faith. Wow. So I call them reverse missionaries. They just didn't know it at the time. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I, I'm a big advocate of like foreign exchange students. Like if you can have a foreign exchange student in your home, even if just for a few weeks, you don't know the impact it's going to have. Oh. So they welcome me. He is intellectually able to match me 
you know, toe to toe, we have countless hours of late night conversations. Once their three toddlers are in bed. Uh, I remember the pink countertops in their kitchens. This is the 1990s. So pink countertops were in, I think. And, um, theological conversations and matching me intellectually. And then uh, my American mom, I've called them now my American mom and dad were still very much in touch. My American mom would just really love on me. Mm. She had a very checkered past and my present was rather quite checkered itself. And so we had a lot of things in common. And so they literally loved me into the kingdom uh, through mm and mind at both. And it's a long story of how I actually came to faith. But the short of it is I, about midway through my year. So right about 30 years ago today, um, I became convinced of first the historical existence of Christ, because I wasn't even sure of that. And second, most disturbingly for an atheist, I became convinced of the historical truth of the physical resurrection of resurrection. Jesus. And mm -hmm. this is a bed of nails to sleep on for an atheist to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. You have a problem intellectually when you believe that. And so I had to reconcile intellectually and in my heart, how can I be an atheist and at the same time, uh, bear witness to the historical truth of something I cannot deny. God has also wired me with a measure of intellectual integrity. And I mean by that, that I am literally unable to ignore something that I have found out to be true. I'm right. just one of those people who's deeply loyal to truth. And I just thought that atheism was true. And so I was deeply loyal to it. And then when I realized the historical truth of the resurrection, that's a truth I could not ignore. I could have, but it would have fractured how God made me to be. And so I just couldn't fight that. And so I did something that uh, I'm not really proud of. It's a very uh, sad conversion story in many ways, but I became so convinced of the truth of the resurrection, intellectually speaking, that I realized that someone who raises from the dead uh, deserves five minutes of your attention. Come on. Right. right. And deserves uh, a little bit of a, uh, of an, of an opening of your own heart to examine the claims of such a person. And his claims were so radical to me, the claims of Christ that, I couldn't ignore them, but I was terrified, Angela, because the resurrection proves a lot of things about Jesus and about God, but it doesn't necessarily prove his trustworthiness. At least to me, initially, it didn't. And so I was terrified to have to put my life in the hands of a God I may not trust. Yeah. Uh, and I have uh, I have massive father figure trust issues. Okay, I come from a highly dysfunctional family, so massive trust with my father, my earthly father. So play this all plays into it. So I was unable to trust God for the rest of my life. Hmm. But I've since learned to say that it's just like dark chocolate, which I love so much, Angela. If you've never had really dark, high quality French chocolate mm -hmm. you just don't know what chocolate is yeah. at least that's my <laughs> perception on chocolate so i can describe it to you i can describe to you the colors and the textures and the flavors and the smells of dark chocolate but there comes a point you are going to have to take a bite out of the dark stuff and if you don't you cannot say whether you like or not what I'm talking about, because you have to experience it for yourself. And I believe you have the right to spit it out if you don't like it. And mm -hmm. much with, with the arrogance of a 17 year old heart who was so limited and so blind, but also so sincerely seeking, mm -hmm. it did the only thing I knew to do. I told God, I'm willing to take a bite, but if I don't like it, I'll spit it out. And so I told God for one week, I am going to stop fighting everything that I believe I suspect is true, but that terrifies me about you. Mm. For one week, I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to stop fighting you. But if I don't like it, I'm taking my life back. And that's why I like to say, quoting C.S. Lewis, that I became the most reluctant convert in all of France. He says England, but for me, it was France, even though I was in the States. Angela, what happened when... I struck this bargain, quote unquote, with God is a piece I had never experienced before. Truly, the, the wrestling inside of me just vanished because for one week I could take a vacation, what I thought was going to be a vacation from my own intellectual pursuits and my own self-sufficiency. Angela, self-sufficiency is heavy and exhausting. Mm, that's good. That's what I found out and I could rest and 
his truth and his spirit just <laughs> wooed me. Wow. So much so that I find myself about five years later sharing the story with a friend like you and I are doing right now. And she asks the obvious question, what happened at the end of the week? Yeah. And I looked at her and I went, I, I never thought about it. Mm. It never entered my mind to take my life back because the peace, the presence was so beautiful that he had become trustworthy by experience. I had tasted the chocolate and there was no going back. And so that's, I went, I literally got baptized a month later and I went back to France, still dripping wet from baptism, wow. basically. Um, and that was 30 years ago. And that's how I tasted and I saw initially the goodness of the Lord in ways that, oh, Angela, we serve such a good and kind God. We really do. Oh, that's such a beautiful story, Stephanie. I'd heard you share that at, at Speak Up, but it, it's it's just deeply impactful for so many reasons. I think there's people listening and you've been praying for someone who's just turned their back on the Lord, or they just refuse to accept that maybe he is who he says he is. God can use our design. He designed you, Stephanie. So I love the fact that he created you with this brilliant mind, with this intellectual hunger and that's what he used to first demonstrate his, his, who he was, the credibility of who he is. And then the trustworthiness, you know, my dad and I wrote a book on the life of Thomas a year ago. And so we took a deep dive into what you're talking about. Like Thomas was completely removed from community and he needed that, that confirmation. I don't believe it unless I see it for myself, skepticism, disappointment, and the beauty of God is the invitation he's always extending to come closer to him. And when we do, when we take that one week off of whatever is pushing back on who Jesus is, he, he knows exactly what we need. He knows the inroad that will most connect with our own heart, our own mind. And I love the language that you use surrounding your relationship with the Lord. Taste and see that he is good. This is an explosion for your spiritual taste buds. And your podcast, it is such a, a phenomenal top-ranked podcast, The Gospel Spice. Tell us about The Gospel Spice. What does this mean? This is your whole ministry, Gospel Spice. So in connection with kind of the language you hear Stephanie using, I want you to kind of share that with us. Yeah, it's it's so very much connected. And I love what you're saying. I I, I feel a kindred spirit with Thomas in many ways, right? And <laughs> so I, I love everything you just shared. It's so true. Um, well, so I came to faith l largely through my American mom and dad and a very small, vibrant church community in Pennsylvania. And then I left, went back to France and got married, lived my life. As you mentioned, uh, we lived in North Africa. We lived in the UK and France and a lot of different places. And then we moved back to the States, uh, I would say eight or nine years ago. Mm. And when we moved back, I really... 25 years, 20 some years had passed. And I really thought that we were re-entering the same America that I, we had left 20 years prior. Mm. And, and specifically for me, it meant uh, this vibrant community of Christ followers. That's the slice of America that I had discovered as a 17 year old. And that led me to him. And so we came back and let's just say that it wasn't like that at all. And even though I ended up working uh, as the women's director for a large church and I immersed myself in Christian ministry, I met a lot of Christians who had a rather stale and lukewarm faith. Mm. And Angela, it grieved me to no end because God, I've seen God literally use dreams and visions to lead people to him. Yes. But in my case, he used a good old fashioned American mom and dad and family and church community. He mm. used American Christians. And so because of that, my husband, who grew up in a different faith, came to faith. And then we were able to raise our kids so that they now believe in, in Christ for their Lord and Savior fully on their own. They're in college. And so our entire life trajectory was changed because of a group of faithful American Christians. Mm. And now we're moving back stateside and I'm not finding that same vibrant faith where I'm living. And so I have this debt of gratitude to bring back to American Christians in particular, the spice that God gave me through American Christians 25 years ago. I went around the world and I came back with that spice that they had initially given me, the fire 
that they had given me. And so I, my, my passion, as long as I'm stateside and I'm French, so I don't know how long that's going to be. Uh, but for now, as a French person who has experienced Christ all over the world and is now stateside, I am bringing back to American Christians, the spice of the gospel, mm. the gospel spice that God gave me through American Christians, uh, American Christians gave me gospel spice and now I'm giving it back. So that's the idea is that we really want to come alongside people who've experienced a measure of staleness in their relationship with God. People who are looking around, maybe who've been going to church their entire lives and they're looking around and they're seeing people in worship and people enraptured in their love with the Lord and they can't relate to that, but they wish they could, or they're going through a season of dryness and desert, or, you know, they just went through another holiday season and Christmas just feels stale and boring. They know there should be more, but it just doesn't feel like that. So we come alongside these people, these dear, precious children of God in the church who wish to rekindle their passion for Christ and re-experience, taste and see him in fresh new ways. And so that's what we do. We do this through the podcast, online Bible studies, uh, leadership trainings, all sorts of courses, because it's my passion to bring the spice of the gospel back to the people who gave it to me initially. Oh, I love that so much. You make me think of Paul when you're talking like mm. When you say this debt of gratitude and, you know, my husband and I have pastored for 30 years. So you're, you're like, I'm about to take a lap over here because you're preaching my love language of like, I, there's a million ways, I, a million things I can, the healthier directions I can go are, right now. My mind is the spinning. The easier your marriage will because be. So there's a lot focus of on getting healthy in terms of self-care and on keeping your window of tolerance open. And this is it's why I'm going to start with you on this him, one. I, and I heard the question about when they grade there. on you. There's no vibrancy. When you have a healthy relationship window of tolerance, that means you're trying to get sleep, you're trying to decently get good nutrition and fitness, and you're trying to make sure that you are Allowing yourself crisis. stretching so really died, and, and that really just the attending to the life. basic but self-care I, and, and of life, that does, eating, sleeping, you know, exercise. When you do that, that you're so much about, more able to handle time, your spouse's nuances and idiosyncrasies, and you even find them with the Lord more alive. adorable and cute. So when and you encounter, when you see their Enneagram best gifts, instead of just focusing on those worst things, you can say, oh my gosh, I forgot that they were such a wonderful artist. Here I was thinking about how they delve into melancholy, but back that spice back i'm thinking as i'm saying that like when you're sick i just got over being really sick and i couldn't taste for a couple of days you don't even feel like eating because you it all tastes like like cardboard there are people that have lost their spiritual taste like they're just the taste buds are are dull or numb and so even if you're reading maybe it's just dry and it's stale what encouragement do you have for someone who's saying, yes, that's me. I don't want to walk through that this year, that same way. Yeah. Give us a couple of moments of hope from your own experiences, Stephanie. Yeah. Oh, I I'm so right there with you. And no one, at least in my experience, no one actually fully arrives. I can't say that I've arrived. I still struggle through these seasons. And even though I'm, you know, I'm passionate to teach against that staleness, I still fight for it, for the, the spice and the, and the excitement. So I think it's very normal. So you're not crazy or weird if you're experiencing that. I think we all go through that. Actually, I think part of the solution is to begin seeing it as an opportunity to go deeper with the Lord. I think it's in some ways God saying, hey, I've got something more for you. Are you ready for it? Mm. It's like saying, you know, have you maybe limited your spiritual cooking to garlic salt? Because I love garlic salt, but if this is what you sprinkle everything and everywhere, you're not going to taste it after after a That's while, it's good. like you've gone numb. Your spiritual taste buds are not tasting it, not because you're sick and recovering from a cold, but just because that's all you ever taste, because that's all you ever use. So it's going to the same um, content all the time and then wondering why nothing feels fresh and new. Well, it could be that scripture has a vast array, a spice rack of mm. spices that you haven't tasted. So what if God is inviting you to move away from the all-purpose garlic salt of basic faith and what is basic, basic to you now, which might have been advanced, but you've grown into it. So it's actually almost an invitation and, and a reward from the Lord of saying, you've gone this far, let's go deeper. Let's go beyond the garlic salt. Let's incorporate new spices, the cumin, the cilantro, the, 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 you know, the, the fresh spices of scripture 
And so it could be, you know, depending on what you're looking at, it could be that it's you need a, uh, a fresh exposure to the first century Jewish culture, but in a way that isn't academic, in a way that is real and heartfelt. I've lived in North Africa and the Middle East for almost a decade. And so it transformed my faith because I was I literally had experiences that felt like they were taken straight out of the book of Acts in terms of the fellowship of the believers or how the Holy Spirit was moving in the lives of very closed countries and just things you're like oh my goodness nothing can replace that and so the first century jewish culture is key i like to play with the french culture and how would people in europe or in france experience christ anew and we are a hard to reach people i always joke that god had to take me out of france in order to bring me to him and so now i bring france and the french culture culture to Americans and what is what would it feel like to read your Bible in French? For example, um, we use different words, but my favorite life verse is Philippians 3.10 by Paul. For my determined purpose is that I may know Christ, mm. the power of his resurrection, and yes, the fellowship in his sufferings. Now let's camp on the word to know Christ for a second. In French, as in Greek, there's several words that are translated to know in English. And you may be familiar with that. There's about a thousand times in scripture, old and new, that the word to know or knowledge or knowing is used in English. Well, out of those three, uh, out of those thousand times or so, there's about 300 times if you read your Bible in French, you would find the word savoir. And savoir, you have in English as in savoir faire, which is to know how. So in French, when we use the word savoir, it's head knowledge. It's uh, knowing your facts about something, like it's mathematical, it's historical dates, it's even the Proverbs, uh, the book of Proverbs, the wisdom of Proverbs is considered savoir because it's it's the idea of you can acquire that knowledge without having to experience it. That's the whole point of Solomon writing to his son so that the son will not make the same mistakes his father has, yeah, right? So it's wisdom. it's kind yeah. of learning from a textbook. It's the So it's all of that. And it's very valuable knowledge. But then 700 times, it's not the word savoir in French, nor is it in the Greek equivalent. It's actually the French Connaître, which is Gnosko in Greek, which is heart knowledge, experiential knowledge, mm -hmm. the knowledge you can only have acquired from having tasted wow. the chocolate. So again, head knowledge is knowing all about the chocolate. Heart knowledge is tasting the chocolate. And 700 times in scripture, twice as many as savoir is connaître. That tells you something about the kind of relationship and knowing, not just knowledge, that God wants for his people. And of mm -hmm. course, when Paul says, for my determined purpose is that I may know Christ, you know which one he's using. He's using connaître. It's about heart knowledge. It's about tasting and seeing Christ as the goodness of the Lord. And so you don't have that in English, but you have it in French. So that's what I do is I take French. I take the language um, of scripture and we make it exciting. And then we spend a lot of time together making scripture exciting again, making your relationship with God exciting again through prayer, through fellowship, through relationships with one another. And so there's, um, there isn't one recipe. There's an entire spice rack that is available in order to go beyond the all-purpose garlic salt to make Jesus exciting in you again. It's so good. I just love this so, so much. I love this whole frame because France is known for its cooking. I spent two weeks in France and I probably gained 10 pounds in two weeks because I mean, the, the, the bread and the croissants and the- Probably walked it off though, right? Because oh, we walked US, it off too. That's so true. But the, this whole analogy, and another thing I'm loving, Stephanie, is that the Lord really revealed himself to you through this intellectual pursuit that you had, this intellectual honesty that you had to have a reckoning about. But now you're teaching from a place of the heart because that's not enough. It's not enough just to know intellectually. The scripture says even the demons know who he is. That's head knowledge of who he is. But this invitation we have to know him on a, what, what other God invites us to know him. There is no one else like him that says, I'm inviting you to know me, not just from an intellectual historical standpoint. And that's great to know that. I mean, I'm finishing up grad school and the more I know, know intellectually, Stephanie, what I'm finding is the more that it causes me to fall in love with him. I learned some new aspect, like you said, stop just putting the same spice. My husband's a phenomenal Italian cook. And if all he ever used was garlic salt, 
it would get boring. It wouldn't taste, you know, he'll, he'll switch something up. He'll try a new recipe. He'll throw in a new ingredient and change the flavor of it. Yeah. And that our relationship with the Lord doesn't have to stay stale. It might have gotten stale and that might be where you are right now listening or watching, but listen to Stephanie's encouragement. It does. I hope you can just hear the passion in her voice and to know that whatever has caused your relationship to the Lord, maybe your spiritual taste buds to become dull. It doesn't have to stay that way. There's encouragement for you to know that whatever this year holds, you can live in just this fresh awareness of his presence. I don't ever want to stop learning and leaning into that. It, it you know, it makes me think stepping the scripture that we need to worship in spirit and in truth. So we know, we know intellectually, we read the scripture, we study, and then we also experience the presence of the Lord, which changes everything. So I just love, I love everything that you're saying. You have two new courses that just started right here in January, right? Can they still hop in? Because I'm sure some people are like, I, I want to, I want to know all the things, Stephanie and gospel spice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so insightful. Everything you just shared. I so agree. And again, I want you to hear that there's absolutely no judgment in saying that maybe there's some staleness in your faith right, because I'm right. the first to experience it. And second, it might not be staleness as in like, you've gotten so used to the all purpose garlic salt that again, your taste buds are not tasting it. So let's switch it up exactly like your husband is doing. So mm -hmm. we're not dissing the all purpose garlic salt. We're saying there's more to it. So That's let's right. keep that, but then let's, let's add more to it. So, um, and, and I think the key is, and, and I'll get to your question in just a second, but I think the key is in defining what matters most in your life. And for me, it is this never ending quest of delighting in God. And, and you've mentioned my motto, God's glory, our delight. It truly is. Um, it, it has become so foundational for me that I seek to delight in the Lord because among other things, he has chosen to delight in me, which is something that just blows my mind. But, but the idea of God's glory, our delight is I want to delight in the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is simply the visible manifestation of his presence, right? So it's, it's delighting in his presence made manifest in my life and in the lives of those around me, which means I'm on, always on a quest to find him, even in the most unlikely places. And you've traveled the world. So you know that God is in the most unlikely of places, but he's there and, and ready to be revealed. So what about the most unlikely places of my own heart? And how do I relinquish control so that he becomes ever more uh, present so that his glory, the visible manifestation of his presence is ever more real in my own heart and in my own lives and in those around me. And to, to, cause then the challenge is once you've tasted the spice of the gospel, you're going to want to become the spice of the gospel to someone else. That's it's good. irresistible. That's good. I mean, Jesus calls us the salt of the earth. So that's actually the true mission is once you've, I mean, you, you're never going to be able to shut me up about dark chocolate. I love it so much, right? And, and and Jesus, even more so, he loves chocolate, though he's never tasted it. But like, I'm sure, you know, I'm even more, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. We get it. We get it. So in the same way, I think the end goal is to delight in the Lord so much that you're going to invite others uh, in a delightful way to join you in your delight of him. And so uh, again, that's what we do. So I, I would invite you to check out the Gospel Spice podcast. Right now, we have a series that call, that is titled Jesus, Rabbi, and Lord. We're about, I would say, a good third of the way through. And it is the series where we walk um, with Jesus through the gospel of Matthew from a deeply rooted first century Jewish perspective. And so I've had so many people tell me that it has just brought so much um, insight into their reading of the gospel and that. that it has really deepened their faith. So I would humbly uh, invite you to check out Jesus, Rabbi and Lord on the podcast this, this month. And then we also have two courses. One is called In the Footsteps of Jesus. And it is um, a course where we I'm literally taking you on a virtual six week trip to Israel. Mm. It's very hard to go to Israel right now. We're all praying for this beautiful country. But right now, the only way you can go to Israel is virtually unless you are on a medical team and so join us in the footsteps of Jesus where we are uh, exploring Israel from my own perspective I was in Israel last summer and so in the footsteps of Jesus is the next way next best way to go to Israel right now and then uh, we're also launching in a very different note uh, a leadership training. So we've trained leaders all over the world, people who are in lay leadership positions in their churches or in their communities, and they wish 
to be a little more equipped to have a Bible study, to share the gospel, to do something that might seem small or might seem huge, and they just need some equipping. And we are passionate to, um, again, love, especially American Christians, but anyone who's willing to um, become better equipped at sharing sharing their faith in the context of a small Bible study or one-on-one -on -one conversations, mentoring. We do a lot of mentoring training. And so that's called the leading well, because it's a deep well to learn how to lead well. And it's, um, it's happening starting in January. Uh, both of those are going to be offered on our gospelspice.com website for your enjoyment. So check it. it out. I love it. And I'm going to put that in the show notes. And I know we both have to hop off in a minute, but I just... I want to say one more thought that came to me as you've been talking, Stephanie, if you go back to Thomas, if you go back to even your own personal experiences that you shared there, it, it grieves me that you you came back to the States and didn't find that vibrant community. Um, and, and now it's your passion. Well, I did. I did. There you were did. some amazing believers, but not everyone was like that. It, that was right. my surprise, right? No, we did I, find a lovely community, but not everyone. So I get it. as I you get well it. know, mm -hmm. and I just want to encourage us like it, if, if you somehow maybe fallen out of community, maybe you were in a church that wasn't healthy. I just want to encourage you to get back in community because that's another way that you can spice up your relationship with the Lord is to do it in community, find a, a, a Bible study you can connect with. If, if you don't know, open up your own home, have a Bible study, invite a few people that you know, because when you start to connect with other believers and you're discussing things and you're learning and growing from each other, there's no substitute for community. Going back to that first century early church, Stephanie, I'm sure you've seen the value. They were doing life together. And I, I feel like ever since the pandemic, we haven't fully really gotten back to that place of, of connection. We're a lot easier just texting, hiding behind a computer. You know, some people go entire days without even hearing somebody's voice. They're just doing everything digitally. We were created for relationship first and foremost with the Lord. And that's the most important relationship. But then that outflow, as you said, that life lived on mission is to then be the spice to others. And so, you know, I, I can picture you, if you're not in community, you're just on the spice rack, but you're somewhere in the back, you know, like you have to like climb over 18 spices, you know, the ones that like, you never even know what's in the back of your spice rack. Like you're valuable. You're valuable to the kingdom of God. We need what you have to offer. So I just want to encourage people to get in community this year um, get in a church, plug in a church, get in a small group. Um, it's just so, it's so crucial for the, for our spiritual health and yeah. uh, to take our relationship maybe to another level that if, especially if you're kind of at a, at a, you know, it's a, a stale place or just a stagnant yeah. place or a plateau in your life. So yeah. I didn't want to end this conversation without encouragement in that direction. And even more, I would say, you know, for your own sake, but also for the sake of everyone around you, my, my pastor ends every week with a blessing that I've taken to heart. He says, um, life is short and we do not have too much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. Mm -hmm. Therefore, be swift to love and make haste to be kind. Because oh. if you are a spice jar in the back of the spice rack, not only do you need community, but we need your spice. We need yeah. your flavor. I need you. Yeah. And so please come because we're missing out without you. So it's for your own sake, but it's also for all of us. That's right. That's right. That's part of making our lives matter is giving our own relationship to the Lord completely to him, but to others, we live in community and that's the way God has designed us. So for better or worse, the, the church is the bride of Christ. And so I believe in it and uh, I want it to be the best it can be. And it needs you. So Stephanie's going to pray for us in just a moment, but Stephanie, I always close with one last question. And I know you love the Bible, so I cannot wait to hear what your answer is. But other than Jesus, who is that person in the Bible that has most inspired you to make your life matter for the kingdom? Okay. I had to think about that. Um, I have, and my answer may change, you know, but right now I would actually say Jacob. Mm. And I don't know if that's a typical answer because Jacob uh, was very self-sufficient, was a control freak, was a manipulator and a cheater. And that's everything I was before Christ. Mm. And he left his encounter with God to, transformed and with a limp. Yes. And I have a limp and I, I lead from a place of limping, which mm. means that there's no, no more arrogance and no more pride. And that's a work only God could have done. And I'm grateful for the limp because that is where vulnerability and authenticity come. And I think 
the best homemade dishes are spiced with a healthy dose of humility and gratitude, which I believe Jacob has learned in his limp and which I am learning too. So. Wow. I don't think anyone's ever said Jacob and what <laughs> he's not a typical, I know like why no. would he, he's not a role model, but unfortunately I, I wish I couldn't relate to him so much, but I sure do. <laughs> no, I totally get it. I would rather walk with a limp and have had an encounter with the Lord than to walk on, you know, straight and confident and be self-sufficient. There's nothing like dependence on the Lord. I know it can feel vulnerable, it can feel scary, but guys go through this year as we've started today, just with an explosion spiritually. And, and it starts by tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. He's good and he's good to us. And the more you know him, the more you'll love him because you'll know his character. He, can, he The Bible is inexhaustible. His character is inexhaustible. You could study him 24 hours a day and never tire of learning something new about who he is. So thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for your passion for the Lord, your spice that you're bringing to the body of Christ for all that you're doing to see us um, live a vibrant faith. And that's so crucial. So I'd love for you to pray for our listeners as we close. Sure. That would be my honor. Oh, precious God, mm. glory King, or heavenly father. We humble our hearts before you. We rejoice over your goodness towards us, the good your good intentions, your good thoughts, your good heart towards us. And Lord, as this new year full of opportunities and, and maybe trepidation and fear looms large before us, may this year, 2024, be for each and every single person who is with us in this conversation. May this year be the year where you have wooed us in ways we can't even begin to imagine, that you would go above and beyond what we can even conceive or imagine in your goodness towards us. I didn't say easy. I said good. Mm. And Lord, if it means some difficult twists and turns, would you allow us to see that you are inviting us out of staleness, out of what we are so familiar and comfortable with, out of self-sufficiency and and, and places of fear, but you are inviting us into the fullness of tasting and seeing your goodness. And Lord, would you allow us, oh, would you by your spirit carve our hearts, meld and mold our hearts so that we would desire to delight in you more than ever? Would you carve in us the desire to delight in you? And if we can't even muster up that desire, Lord, we are willing to be made willing. Would you make us willing to have the desire to delight in you? May we find your glory to be the most delicious and delightful presence in the universe for us. May your holiness woo us ever deeper into your presence. In the glorious and beautiful name of our King and our Lord, Jesus Christ, the one and only. Amen.